Hi, I'm Joe Chura and welcome to 630 Naperville. So glad to have you join me. On this program, we'll get running tips from an expert, learn a five minute look, get help demystifying divorce, and find out how to get plugged in at home. But first, we're off to Lazy Dog to join Kaylin Riswald and Christine Jeffries to get the dirt on some exciting new developments. Welcome to Business Forward. I'm Kaylin Rizbold, President and CEO of the Naperville Area Chamber of Commerce. I am here at Lazy Dog Restaurant and Bar, beautiful location here on 59 in Naperville with the President of the Naperville Development Partnership, Christine Jeffries. Christine, what is the Naperville Development Partnership? Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Kaylin. And the Naperville Development Partnership is a public-private economic development group. We have three tenants, one is to um, retain our businesses here in town, two is to attract new businesses, and three is to help expand all our businesses. Okay, so I wanted, that's what I want to delve into, this expanding of the new businesses. Let's start with the Ogden Corridor. What's new, what's refreshed, and what's coming mm -hmm. over there? So after several years of investment by the uh, city government and partnership with the Naperville Development Partnership, we're starting to see the fruits of our, our efforts. We're we have Costco, which opened, and everybody's familiar with Costco. But we also have several small restaurants, Fast Casual, Amazon Fresh, um, and a new one coming in that's First Watch, which is a new breakfast place coming in, uh, one of the first Midwest locations. Oh, that sounds delicious. Lots yeah. of good food in the area. And there's been other refreshes to the area that people may not notice, but they appreciate. Um, talk right. about what's happening with the wires and the traffic lights and whatnot. So part of the investment in laying the groundwork for redevelopment on East Ogden Avenue was really a lot of, uh, a lot of infrastructure that people don't notice, but uh, 200 trees, streetscape trees going in, undergrounding um, some of the Comet electric lines that were out there and fairly unsightly. Also refresh our electric boxes. Well, it, it sounds like it's not a big deal, each of those were very expensive undertakings, but it laid the groundwork for people, private industry, to want to come in and reinvest. Um, moving from retail to what is really a unique opportunity, the old motel that was over on uh, East Ogden, days in and then Regency in, has been redeveloped into micro apartment units. And there's 112 units, they leased up very quickly. They're fully amenitized and they're perfect little studio apartments with shared amenity space. And they were leased up before they even had their grand opening. That's fantastic news to hear. And, and speaking of being leased up, we are here at Lazy Dog on 59. What's going on on the 59 corridor? What's coming in and going out here? Well, this uh, intersection is, is very active right now. And if we go a little further south, where there was the Walmart and Sam's Club, they have just taken on a whole new persona. So the former Walmart is now Mall of India and India Co. And truly you go into Mall of India, it looks like a mall, and it has all kinds of fabulous stores as well as restaurants. Um, next door in the old Sam's Club is the new Matrix. And all we can say is, wow, this is 120,000 square feet of entertainment space from a seated theater uh, with stage uh, to a bar restaurant with live entertainment stage. And then in the middle is a huge banquet facility that can handle over a thousand people seated and up to 2000 people for concerts. I'm really excited for that. And also the chamber will be hosting their gala January 27th at Matrix. So excited to get there in action. All right, before I let you go, I can't let you go without asking anything else you can tell us, anything new coming that maybe isn't out there yet. Uh, there is some exciting news and it's just over our shoulder here in the Heritage Shopping Center and, and Westridge Court. Bricksmore, the owner of the center, is going to redevelop the corner of Aurora Avenue and Route 59 into what's called Block 59. Block 59 will be a whole new entertainment area. So Lazy Dog will be one of the flagships, one of the anchors here. Um, and then 
Hollywood Palms Theater, of course, will, will remain. All the rest of it will be redeveloped. Uh, obviously, we'll keep a lot of the retailers and keep a lot of the sort, but all new restaurants coming in, outdoor entertainment space that will be programmed year round. So Block 59, watch for it starting, starting spring of 2023. Awesome. Well, it's nice to hear about what's coming and what's already been here and appreciate all the great work you've done to help get it here. So well, we enjoy partnering with the Chamber. Awesome. Thank well, you. thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us here at Business Forward. For more information on all of the things we're seeing talked about, head to nctv17.com. I'm happy to welcome Lori Lassiter, certified personal trainer and running coach at Edward Elmhurst Health to 630 Naperville. Thanks for joining us today, Lori. Thank you for having me on the show. All right, first question, is it possible for anyone to be a runner? Well, unfortunately, no, probably not everyone can be a runner. That's why the first thing I recommend when someone wants to go into running is that they get a medical clearance, in particular, if they're older, or they have cardiovascular issues or bone or joint issues or really any health concern that they might have that they think would interfere with running. That makes sense. When you're just getting started, what are the, some other important tips that you want to really think about when it comes to running? I think the most important thing is to start from your current level of fitness. So if you're not a runner, don't go out and run three miles the first day. I always recommend that people start with a walking program and build up to walking 30 minutes at a time and then start to introduce running intervals. And what I like to use is two minutes of walking and one minute of running for 30 minutes. And then you can slowly start to increase that running interval. Once you get past that point and you've started, what programs would you recommend? Uh, there are online programs that you can follow. Uh, if you're a beginner, make sure you pick a beginner program. If you're running a half marathon, a 5K, a marathon, you know, pick the right distance. And you also want to pick a program, the length of which is going to lead you up to whenever your goal race is happening. Got it. There's a million types of shoes out there. It could be confusing walking into either a large sports store or a running shop. What are some guidelines that people should follow when it comes to picking the right shoes? Well, definitely go to a running store or a store that has a big specialty uh, with runners. Uh, usually it's good if they have a treadmill in there and they're gonna actually look at your gait and see how you're landing on your feet, whether you land on your heel or on your midfoot or on your toes, uh, how heavily you're landing, and also look at your pronation, whether your foot is turning over as you run. And all of those elements are gonna help them pick the right shoe for you. Got it. So what if you're already a runner and you like to try a race, like 5K, half marathon or marathon, what training tips can you share? Well, I would say, I, for, well, first of all, I would say that my, uh, I write a running blog for the Healthy Driven Naperville Half Marathon and 5K. It's at runnaperville.com. And all throughout the summer leading up to the race, I'm sharing lots of different training tips for running in the heat and working on your speed and all kinds of things like that. But I think the main thing is to pick a program that you, that matches up to your fitness level and then really try to stick to it. And it's important to stick to it. So maybe find a running buddy or a running group that you can run with. Uh, motivation becomes an issue as you're training. Got it. That makes sense. I love the, the tip to have a running buddy. I work out with my wife daily and it really helps motivate both of us to have a, a partner training for something. Should runners supplement their runs with strength training? And then what about stretching? How does that fall into someone's workout? I'm a big proponent of strength training for runners. In fact, that's how I got into personal training because I was a runner and I was getting injured quite a bit. And then I discovered strength training. It's very important to focus on your core your hips and your lower body, your legs, your feet, ankles, and do things like single leg training, such as lunges, deadlifts, squats for the core, things like planks and side planks. I actually teach a class called Run Smart once a week, which is strength training for runners. So that's how important it really is to me for runners to strength train. As far as stretching goes, 
I would say focus on stretching after you run rather than before you run and focus on the hamstrings, the calves and the hips. Lori, if I'm training for a race, let's call it a, a 5K or a half marathon, how should I think about what to eat before that race? Well, the most important time for fueling is the night before the race. It's important to have a balanced dinner and get plenty of hydration so that you're not going into the morning dehydrated or underfueled. It's good to have a mix of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Uh, I'm not a big fan of a lot of carbo loading because usually that causes gastric distress. So I would say a nice balanced meal. Um, as far as running in the morning and your pre-race fueling, Everyone is different. It's good to experiment with eating before a race. In particular, for the 5K, it may not be necessary. For a longer race, though, I would definitely recommend doing some pre-race fueling. But it may be nothing more than just Gatorade or a little bit of a carbohydrate source with a little bit of protein, maybe a piece of bread with some peanut butter on it. Um, but I wouldn't do anything in a race that you haven't tried in practice because, again, everyone is different and gastric distress is no fun during a race. Do you want to match up the, the calories that you're going to expel with what you should intake? Do you want to have that like a one-to-one -one ratio? Like, so for example, if you know you're going to run and burn, let's say, 1,000 calories, do you want to have that in your system before the race to have enough energy, or how important is that? No, it's, it's not good to look at it as an equation because if you try to preload the amount of calories that you're gonna expend in the race, you're gonna get pretty sick. For example, if let's take the marathon example. You're probably gonna burn close to 3,000 calories in the marathon. And if you try to eat that in the morning before you run, it will not be good. So what I tell people is for the two or three days before the race, try to increase your calories a little bit by maybe you know three to 400 calories per day, mostly carbohydrates, and your body will through your training and through a little bit of extra eating, we'll have enough fuel on board that you'll be, you'll be fine on race day. That's very helpful. Lori, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate your time and your advice. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Stay with us. We're coming back with more 630 Naperville right after the break. So the Q4, Susan. We were there when your fourth cold brew felt like a heart attack. <laughs> Cold brew has a lot of caffeine in it. We were there for that. Fair. And we're here for everything else. Here it's personal because we get to know you. People from Chicago pull for Chicago. We root for its teams, celebrate its successes, push through its challenges. When people call us the second city, it's misleading. We're second to none. We're hardworking, resilient, but we have a good time. When you live in Chicago, you proudly call this home. Your bank should too. We're Wintrust. Built here, for here. And we've taken our place at Chicago's bank because no other bank can say the same. Welcome back. Next, we're heading to Amber Waves in downtown Naperville with Daniel Tofano to learn how to pull together a polished look in five minutes flat. Simple and easy glam, it's what we're all looking for, whether it's our hair or whether it's our makeup, and what better place to go to in downtown Naperville than Amber Waves. We're here at the intersection of Jefferson and Webster. We're gonna to talk to Gabby, we're gonna to talk to Elena with our model Chris, and see what they have for hot summer looks. We are here at Amber Waves. I'm gonna go through a quick little five minute at home tutorial how to get some super cute beachy waves. Um, this is my model, Chris. I already did her one side of her hair, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to this side. Um, here at Amber Waves, we're an exclusive Bumble and Bumble salon. I'm just gonna prep her real fast with a little um, dry shampoo just to give her a little bit of texture, get rid of some of those oily roots. And then what we're gonna do real fast as well is spray her with a heat shield. It's a Bumble and Bumble heat shield that protects against um, heat up to 450 degrees. So go ahead, just spritz that through. Make sure you give it a good shake first. Brush that through so it evenly distributes. I'm also gonna go ahead and section 
with my large alligator clip because it gives you larger sections. And just keep in mind, when you're doing your quick little beach waves, the larger the sections, the better. You don't want all the curls to be the same anyway. Everything forward and then bring it away from your face. Don't curl to the root and keep your ends out. Give it a good twist, pull that down real fast. And as I'm doing this, you can definitely see that I'm not really too worried about holding it on for too long because you want it nice and soft. And then we're gonna go through for our next section real quick. You can section out with your clip and then while you are at home, when you wanna let these curls cool down right before you run your fingers through it, go ahead, just brush your teeth, put on your makeup, let your curls cool down prior to running your fingers through it. It's gonna give you a little bit of hold, a little longevity to let those curls kind of cool down a little bit. As you can see, I'm not being super precise about the sectioning in Chris's hair. Longer the better. Take some larger sections. Larger the better, makes it a little bit more beachy, a little bit airy. And then we're gonna go ahead and finish off with our Bum Bum Bumble dry spun and a little bit of our demode hairspray for some hold. The dry spun's gonna give you a little bit of texture, a little bit of grit, more of that beachy feel. Now let's go through with our texture sprays real quick. And then like I said, always let that curl, but just for this, I'm gonna show you how everything kind of looks when you run your fingers through everything. Go ahead, turn your head to that side. Nice, soft, tasseled texture. Super beachy for the day for Chris, and we are all set. And now we're here with a quick makeup look to show you that's perfect for summer. So for Chris, I went in with a warm, creamy matte brown all over her lid and blended it kind of up into her eyebrow just to give her like a nice soft wash of color. In her inner corner, I went in with a little bit of a more of a shimmery shade to brighten things up. And then instead of a liquid or cream um, product, I went in with a darker eyeshadow, um, kind of like on her lash line just to give her more of a smoked out effect. And since it's a powder, it's not gonna run or smudge on you in these warmer months. And then to finish her off, I went in with like a soft gloss and just a nice smooth complexion for her. And that's just a nice easy way you can achieve a quick look for these hot months. Quick and easy ways to get glam from the comfort of your own home. Thank you to Gabby, thank you to Elena, thank you to our model Chris for um, giving us some tips and tricks and come and see the girls here at Amber Waves. Thank you. Deciding to get a divorce is never an easy choice. It can get as complicated as Neil Sadaka's song that says, breaking up is hard to do. In this installment of Legally Speaking, Bernicke Law Firm attorneys Rick Carner and James Bernicke take us through some of the questions they get from clients to help us demystify divorce. Welcome, guys. Thanks. Thank you. So, you're, Rick, you're one of the attorneys that handles family law matters. Let's say a couple mutually agrees to a divorce. Is there a thing as a simple divorce? It all really depends. If they do agree 100% on all issues, if they have no children, no assets, they just want to get divorced, possibly. Uh, what happens is they come and say it's a simplified divorce and it turns out to be not true, not really. There's always other issues that pop up. And if you're going to get divorced, uh, a lot of times they ask, hey, can you handle, be the attorney for both of us because we agree on everything? Uh, that's really not a good idea. You know, attorney-client privileges, you can't represent more than one person in the same issue. And if you don't get an attorney, the other side really doesn't know what to do, what to file, and it's gonna increase your, the time greatly and ends up being a lot more costly if you don't, both parties don't have attorneys. Got it. And James, you have seen this a bunch <laughs> and the home just seems like such a, a big topic when it comes to this. Mm -hmm. What happens to the house in a divorce? Yeah, you're right. That's, that's usually the biggest asset that people have. And um, in all divorce aspects, it, it depends. If the couple is married or unmarried, maybe a factor. Um, but generally, that is something that we need to work with them and decide, is, does someone own more of the property? Did someone put more money into it and divide it as such? 
and during a divorce, the parties don't agree what to do with the house, the judge orders it sold and the proceeds divided. Mm -hmm. Sounds like fun. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Rick, if there are kids, what should people be thinking about when getting a divorce when it comes to custody and their children? Well, a lot of times divorce is hard on children and the law goes by the best interests of the children. So they look to see what would be in the best interests of the children. The law recently changed in 2016 where they completely revamped the family law laws where child support is calculated now by uh, both parties are responsible. It's, they just calculate one child support number and it's divvied up based on their incomes in the residential uh, parent. Uh, also, custody and, and visitation, are, that's not called that anymore. And it's changed uh, from custody and visitation to now it's parenting time and uh, allocation of parental responsibilities. And before, like with custody, it'd be one parent would be in charge of all the decision making where the kids go to school, healthcare, religion. Now it can be split between the two parties. Well, half could go to dad, the other half to mom, and, and so on and so forth. But it's based on the best interests of the children. And is that, that's a state law, right? Yes. Got it. Yeah, so. d divorce and custody and all that is all by, driven is by state laws in all 50 states. Actually, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to estate plans, how often should a couple think about updating their estate plan? Whenever there's a change, uh, a significant change, different uh, assets. Are, uh, also, if they're planning on getting divorced, well then basically the courts will decide that, but let's say they want to change beneficiaries or, or they want different things. So it basically all depends upon any significant changes in their estate plan is when you should review it. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Any significant change in your financial plan or uh, what you'd like done if you decide you want someone else to take care of your children or you want to set up a trust for your children if you know, they're getting older, um, it's always a good idea to periodically review that. Uh, we found that people come in and they have an estate plan from maybe 10 years ago and uh, things have changed. They no longer speak with the people that they wanted to sure. take their children, or um, you know, their sister-in-law and brother got divorced, and clearly they probably don't want uh, you know those people, you know, ex-in-law in the will. So uh, it never hurts to have it reviewed and look at it, and just have a, an attorney go over it with you and make sure that uh, what you're putting in there is exactly what you want. So it, so it sounds like anytime there's a change, review it, and then also maybe periodically take it out review it with an attorney once every couple of years, even if there hasn't been a change, because there could be laws affecting it as well. That's true. Yes. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you both. I really appreciate you guys taking the time here today. After the break, we're getting tips on getting your electric vehicle plugged in at home. Don't go anywhere. We're coming right back. Shop, dine, and explore in downtown Naperville. We were there when your kid discovered poison ivy. Now remember, leaves of three. Let it be. We were there for that, and we're here for everything else. Here, it's personal, because we get to know you. Welcome back to 630 Naperville. Up next, we're heading into the field to learn what you need to know to install a residential EV charger in your home. Today at Power Forward DuPage, we are joined by Tim Milburn. He's the managing partner of Green Ways to Go. And Tim, I know your company really um, works with customers and clients. You really recommend to them, right? Um, if they're, when they're looking for an alternative fuel vehicle and supporting infrastructure, you're sort of the consultant that helps package that up for them. Is that right? That's right. We try to help people make informed decisions. Well, this is perfect because we need, we need some of that information. Um, I've been wanting to tackle this topic of you know, electric vehicles and EV charging infrastructure for some time. So thank you so much for, for coming in. Um, let's, let's start at the top. Tell me, 
like what you know when we're going to un unwrap all this let's talk about electric vehicles to start with yeah, starting with the vehicles right now in the u.s there's over 220 models uh, with 36 different vendors there's a lot oh of choices my gosh. they're not all available here but mm -hmm. uh, there's information to help you figure that out mm -hmm. Um, they come in plug-in hybrid, which means you can have a gasoline engine to combined with an electric engine or all electric. Yeah, and so that, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this piece is because I think when people start to be interested or start to do the research, they get a little overwhelmed. And now that I know there's really over 200 choices, that, that's, that's just a lot. Um, how much do they cost? I guess that's the first thing I'm going to think of. Like, that's probably a wide swath of So when you buy an EV cost. or look at buying an EV, right now, it's a, a little bit more than a gasoline engine vehicle counterpart for passenger vehicles. Mm -hmm. There's also some shuttle buses and trucks that are coming, and they're much more expensive. But basically, it's not a huge investment, and with incentives, you can actually have it for less mm -hmm. with an EV. You also have to consider the infrastructure. You, you may want to put in a charger at home, for example. Yeah, definitely. And um, actually, there's another question that pops up in my mind is really, what is the difference between you know, refilling with electricity versus gasoline. So I've uh, got some demonstration tools to yeah. show you. There's different levels of chargers. So one's a household current, level one. Another is also a household that's 240 volt. And then there's some bigger chargers out in public. Uh, and each of them has certain requirements and investments. Um, the level one comes with a vehicle typically. The level two is maybe a thousand to three thousand dollars to install it. And that's because it. of the convenience of that fast charging. Right. This yeah. will charge like ten times faster than the level one. Um, and, but in either case, I want to make the point that you want to have a qualified, certified installer. Make sure it's done safely. I like that you made that point. Thank you so much. Um, but you know, going back to that charging piece and the public charging or having it in your home, that really kind of brings up for me one of the reasons why I'm a little hesitant is you know where are the public charging stations how easy it is to find them and gosh you know if you if you run out of battery is it the same as running out of gas I'll say yes if you have a battery only uh, if you have a plug-in hybrid you still got gasoline um, right. but to find every, any smart device you can find chargers in the area and in urban areas like where, where we are in Naperville that's a non-issue there's like 40 chargers around this area so it's easy to find public charging. Most people charge at home. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same thing. You go up, you plug in, just like a gasoline tank. Mm -hmm. It's easy. And I know, you know, there's so much, again, with this topic. We can talk about the maintenance and the cost and the, you know, the savings and all, all that's wrapped into these decisions. But I remember somebody at some point was telling me about seasonality and how that can affect your your vehicle, is that right? Uh, cold takes uh, some of the oomph out of the battery, so you can lose for the older EVs, is like 20 or 30 percent in a cold day, oh. so you, you wouldn't get as oh. many miles because of the battery chemistry because you're using the heat. Oh boy! Uh, but now so you really want to have to plan for that. Exactly. So the EV drivers learn. They learn quickly, learn, and they <laughs> yeah, adapt. I imagine to it. so. <laughs> uh, but now they have systems to preheat the battery and reduce that risk, so you can get almost the full miles that you get in the summer. I love that, and I love that you're you're sharing this kind of information. Um, tell me, tell me this as we start to wrap up. What about incentives? I also kind of hear, you know, people throwing these words around, you know, you know, all sorts of tax credits and this and that. Um, tell me about that. So in where we are, Naperville has rebates for the chargers. Mm -hmm. um, there's also rebates for the vehicles in Illinois. There's federal rebates or tax credits rather for buying a vehicle, and there may be more coming in Illinois. Excellent. Well, I think. All this information put together will at least give um, folks a starting point, um, a charge point, if you will, Ooh. right? <laughs> Tim, thank you so much for stopping by today. I just knew you were the perfect person to have in for this discussion. Your level of expertise and the knowledge that you bring, it was just wonderful. Thanks again for stopping by. Thank you, it was my pleasure. If you'd like more information about the purchase of an electric vehicle and the supporting infrastructure you may need, please visit our website. We have so many resources available to you. Also, for more information about the City of Naperville's rebate program, you can visit the City website. Next up, producer Kevin Maycheck is back with another gem. This one focuses on the smaller Naperville communities that collectively make the city great. Did you know that Naperville is home to more than 170 different subdivisions? Each one is its own gem that helps make the city of nearly 150,000 people 
feel much smaller and more intimate. Each has its own character and its own way of bringing people together. Their importance couldn't be more evident than when the 2021 tornado struck several areas of Naperville and Woodridge. Neighbors came together in the impacted subdivisions to help one another, even when their own homes were badly damaged and in need of help themselves. And the idea of a subdivision coming together got residents not only through the aftermath of a tornado, but also through the pandemic. The Brookdale subdivision, for example, supported its own struggling small business, Nature's Best Cafe. Homeowners raised money for the business through a GoFundMe page and a garage sale. Many subdivisions hosted car parades and drive through celebrations to honor essential workers. In Ashbury, siblings Alyssa and Alex Dunn spread cheer by having meals delivered to families during the holidays. Neighborhoods often show support for one of their own who may be going through a tough time. A simple gesture, such as making the porch lights red for a 10-year-old battling cancer, can be uplifting and unifying. For these reasons, our many subdivisions in Naperville are a gem that make the city shine bright as a whole. I love the sense of community here and the way the neighbors show up for one another. That's going to do it for us on this edition of 630 Naperville. Remember, if you think you can do more, you can. I'm Joe Chura and I'll see you next time.